Welcome to Insight. Today we're chatting with Lawrence Wheeler, director of the North Carolina Museum of Art. Larry has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Larry, for joining us today. Pleasure to be here in Miami Beach. <laughs> so this is a wonderful, wonderful regional museum that represents the world of art to the people around the museum, but also the people of North Carolina to the world of art. Talk about the place of this museum in the arts ecosystem of the United States of America. Well, you referred to it as a regional museum, <clears throat> and of course we are. Uh, we consider ourselves one of the leading art institutions of the southeastern United States. Uh, I think without question we are the you know, the most important cultural institution in the state of North Carolina, therefore coming with that role is a responsibility to lead, uh, to enlighten, uh, to excite, to all engage. those E words that we right. use these days, engage, <laughs> you know. It's true. I mean, I think that we're caught, I know caught, uh, we have this extraordinary opportunity to use some of the greatest cultural resources ever made by the hand of man when you consider the great art that's contained in art museums. You know, every museum has great art. Uh, it's all different um, from one place to the other, but there's not a museum that would call itself a museum without something they're extraordinarily proud of in terms of the history of civilization. And we're no exception. I think that we begin with uh, the beginnings of the Western tradition, we pay attention to Greece and Rome and Egypt and how that informed subsequent uh, uh, creative eras. Uh, we are very strong in Western art beginning with the Renaissance in Europe and uh, have some of the greatest uh, 15th, 16th, 17th century paintings in this country and that's not often known by people. We're trying to make it better known by people. But most of all, we want it to be uh, become part of the lives of the people we have a mandate to serve, uh, which are the citizens of North Carolina. But to the degree we serve them well, we serve the world better too. So let's talk a little bit about the shape of your collection. It's, so, it's such a fascinating and deep collection. Let's talk about some of the gems of the collection. Where are your favorites and the favorites of the, your curators? Every curator has a favorite in their own um, own collections. You know, I think that you, if you look across the collection, <clears throat> I always go to the Giotto uh, Pruzzi altarpiece, which is such a, a rare work of art in the world and in the country. And back to when we lent that work to the Uffizi, which was rare for us to do, but we were under construction, therefore we could let it go for a little while. Uh, it was uh, considered the central piece in the piece that, that in the Giotto show. retrospective, and in fact, they kept it for a while and made it the centerpiece of their early Renaissance uh, galleries, which was high high praise. Uh, so to have that in the collection, uh, which belongs to the people of North Carolina, right. uh, is an extraordinary asset. How was that acquired? Well, the Samuel Crest Foundation, which has been a huge patron, shall we say, when Samuel Crest was living, he assembled one of the greatest collections of Renaissance and old uh, master masterpieces in the, in, in, in the world and brought them to the United States. And he had a very large collection in the 1940s. Toward the end of his life, he was considering what to do with it. And he had determined that he would give it away and he would give it you know, first of all, whatever the National Gallery of Art wanted, it could have. And then after that, uh, regional museums uh, where he did business, the Crest Five and Dime stores, right. sort of the Sam Walton of his day, uh, received certain numbers of works. Well, the interesting thing uh, for us is that we were not a museum in 1947. The General Assembly, the legislature of the state appropriated $1 million one million dollars. Yeah, to begin a collection of art for the people of North Carolina, mm. not to build a building, but to begin to collect art. Well, this was unprecedented. This had never been done by a publicly elected body in this country, including the National Gallery of Art. Great chutzpah. And we, um, 
took that million dollars back then and went into the world after the Second World War and acquired great masterpieces. So the lure to Samuel Crest was that the state's going to do this million dollars. Would you be willing to give works of art to match that million dollars? Ultimately, I think we, he gave us 83 great masterpieces, including the Giotto, uh, which became the anchor of our old master collection. So with the million dollars, we could go out and buy great American masterpieces that corresponded to the European masterpieces. And when we opened our first building in 1956, uh, it was called the Miracle on Morgan Street. This small museum in this small southern city of Raleigh all of a sudden has one of the great collections in the country. And it's even better today, of course, much better. Let's talk about a more recent acquisition. Let's talk about Rodin. Oh, Rodin, Iris Cantor. Uh, we did the dance and we became great friends as a result of her lending us uh, a significant number of Rodin for an exhibition in the year 2000. And I persuaded Iris to come and be the honorary chair, which she didn't particularly want to do, but agreed to do and we treated her well and she had a wonderful time. And so Iris and I became friends at that point. The exhibition was extraordinarily successful. We had more than 200,000 people come to that exhibition. And so I knew that, um, that this work needed to be a part of our collection. The people really responded to it. And as we uh, mapped out plans for a new building, which was to be designed by the architect Thomas Pfeiffer, we had the opportunity to create new spaces for the Rodin collection and that we could have a gallery, we could have a garden, we could name things for Iris and Bernie Cantor. And uh, I went to her with this proposal. I said, you know, I think you probably are considering giving the collection away at a certain point. Would you consider giving the lion's share of it to us? says, why the hell would I do that? <laughs> I said, well, you like me. Uh, the people of North Carolina love Rodin. And I think it, and here is Raleigh in the heart of one of the progressive centers of the South and the triangle is rapidly growing. The center, these great universities and educational institutions, it could really advance scholarship around Rodin. It could serve a lot of purposes. Plus there is no great collection of Rodin in the South, period and we could become that. And she says, well, I won't say no, but I won't say yes. So we continued to court that relationship and ultimately she agreed to give 30 Rodins to the museum. So we do have the gallery and we do have the garden. It's quite spectacular. I think one of the most beautiful installations of Rodin in the world, including the Musée Rodin in Paris. Now, in order to actually have these discussions, you, you also have a business that has to self-sustain. Hmm. You're running a business. You yes. have income streams. Some of them are earned. Some of them are contributed. Talk about the business aspects. How large is your institution's budget? Mm -hmm. What kind of staff do you have? A big budget, I think, for us. Um, when I began as director uh, in 1994, we had an operating budget of about five and a half million dollars. At that point, the um, budget was probably 80% funded by the state of North Carolina and 20% had to be raised or earned. Today, our budget is $22 million and 80% is privately raised and funded or uh, available through endowment uh, and about 20% is uh, invested by the state and this is the operating budget there are some eccentric parts yeah. of the budget as well as in is the case in any institution but we're about an 80 20 but it's a public private partnership and that 20 percent from the state that's a significant amount of money in terms of tax dollars going into a single cultural institution but over the course of time they have also given us 165 acres of land uh, on which we can develop a sculpture park and all sorts of uh, engagement activities with the community. It becomes good health and recreation and sort of syncs up with the values of the new society of the 21st century. And the state has built us buildings. They gave 
me, you know, $65 million to build a new building. The state money outright for a new building, actually it rose to about $80 million before I was finished. That was state and city county money. So government basically built the building with my promise that we would raise endowments to sustain it. And so, again, they did their part, we do our part, and we continue to, uh, to have a very uh, productive relationship that way. Larry Wheeler, thank you so much for sharing the work of your museum, of your work in North Carolina, and thank you so much for your insights. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, so did I, thanks. <laughs>